when it comes to great music, like it's subjective, right? I mean, it has to be subjective. Some of you like country music. I, I don't get it, okay? Now, don't judge me, people. All right? Thank you, Eunice. Uh, but I think we can all agree on some things. I think that a great song needs to have a great melody, something that's catchy. I think, you know, some people are more concerned with the rhythm, like how does it make me move? It, it, does it get me that way? But for me, I think the separator between a good song and a great song is the lyrics. And I know that that's subjective. That's just me. And you can't just, it, lyrics can't just be about anything. It has to be these deep emotions, these things that move you in some way, right? Nobody's ever written a banger about going out to get the mail. Like it doesn't exist. No one won this Grammy award by rapping about moving the clock back at daylight savings time. Like it's deep human emotion is what makes a great song. And some people love, love songs. And that's just who you are. I'm, I don't think that love songs are my favorite. I actually think that it's loss and sadness. Those are the songs that really get me tears, not love. And this idea of tears is something that goes all throughout every genre of music. Justin Timberlake, he doesn't want you to cry. He wants you to cry me a river, right? Cry me a river. Yeah. Um, if you think about Aerosmith in rock, they were crying when I met you. Now I'm trying to forget you. Reba McIntyre says the cowgirls don't cry which answers the age-old question of whether Taylor Swift is country or not, because she's got teardrops on her guitar. So if anyone asks, that's a solid logical proof right there. Tears are a part of being human. It's all throughout art and literature and movies and music. It's everywhere. But I think that people are sometimes surprised when you read your Bible at just how often tears are on the pages within scripture. It's all over from the Old Testament to the New. And King David, who is like the manliest warrior king in the history of Israel, here's what he says in Psalm 6.6. 6. He says this, I am weary with my moaning and every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. The bed he got the bed and the couch wet. He's crying so often. Job cries tears in the book of Job over what he's lost, but also because his friends just don't understand him and because they're giving him bad advice and they're accusing him, Job is crying tears. There's a whole book called Lamentations. It's about lament. It's about humiliation and, and, and pain. It's about loss. The Bible is filled with tears. 2,000 years ago, a rabbi named Jesus walked up onto a mountainside and he sat down and he began to teach his disciples. He began to speak directly to their restless hearts, but also to their broken hearts. And in our series called Blessed, we're looking at these eight statements that we find in Matthew 5, 1 through 4. Tori just read us two of them, but I want us to go back again and read these four verses. So if you've got your Bible, you can pull that out or you can follow along on the screen. What does it mean to be blessed? Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up onto the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We've already seen that all throughout the Bible, there are tears. There are people who are mourning. But when you start to look at the reasons behind why someone is mourning, well, you find that there is a lot of reasons for the tears that we see in Scripture. 
And so we have to, if we're going to understand what Jesus is saying to us here in Matthew 5 about being blessed, we're going to have to understand what type of mourning he's talking about. What exactly is he referring to? And so right now, I want you to pull out your notes, pull out your notebooks, pull out your phones, get something to write with this morning. All right, this will help you to understand this. We're going to talk about different types of mourning that we see in the Bible so that we can begin to get an understanding of what Jesus is referring to. The first type is just this. It's general sadness. And I went with the most vague one to begin with because this is also the most common type of mourning that you see in Scripture. In general, this sadness that we see is often in response to loss. And all of us know that pain of loss. If loss has not touched your life in a meaningful way that causes you tears and mourning, it will at some point. And we see because scripture is true to life and true to reality, it doesn't just paint some idealized picture that there are people who are mourning and grieving and shedding tears over loss. Some of you might know what's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept over the loss of his friend Lazarus. And I think that tears are a gift that God gives to us when we suffer loss. We think in our culture that tears are a sign of weakness or something to hide or be ashamed of. And yet that's not, that's not what we see in the Bible. Tears are a gift. Can you imagine feeling the sense of loss and pain that you have experienced with the loss of a loved one and and not being able to have that outlet of tears? I mean, it would poison our soul, wouldn't it? Tears are this gift. It's, an, it's a way that we can sort of cleanse our emotions. It helps us to grieve and mourn properly. And we see these tears all over. Loss is one reason that we see them. Another one that we see is loneliness. Loneliness is caused tears throughout scripture. All the way back in Genesis, we see that we are created to be in a relationship with God but we are also created to be in a relationship with others. It's not good that man would be alone. And so many of us can identify with this deep sadness and mourning over feeling lonely, can't we? For some of us, it has been this sense at some point or another that God is far away or God has abandoned us and it causes us tears and pain. But for others, it's just this understanding that, man, I, I feel like I lack these deep human connections and relationships and friendships and I am desperately lonely. And that causes us to mourn and be sad and have tears. Disappointment is something that you see causing tears in the Bible. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 9, Jeremiah is one of the prophets in the Old Testament. He spent his entire life talking to his fellow Israelites and warning them, you you are walking away from God. God will judge you. Listen to me. Stop chasing after idols. Listen to me. You are sinning. God will judge. And Israel never listened to him. And at some points, Jeremiah just records his bitter disappointment Like in chapter 9, verse 1, he says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I could just weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He just wishes that he could get all of that disappointment washed out of him, that his whole head could become a fountain of tears so that he could deal with this mourning and this sense of disappointment. So many of us experience that same disappointment as those that we love walk away from Christ or make decisions that we know will cause pain and hurt. And there's nothing we can do when we're bitterly disappointed. We see tears of discouragement in scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, the apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, who is his sort of protege, another pastor. And he says, Timothy, I pray for you because I remember your tears the last time we were together. Life is discouraging sometimes. Ministry is discouraging. People are discouraging. And sometimes it feels like, man, I cannot get up one more time. Life has knocked me down. This person has disappointed me. Things have not gone my way. I am struggling over this sin. I can't seem to gain victory. And I'm just tired and discouraged. And you weep tears. 
Briefly, there's, there's others, anxieties and concerns. We also see tears not just being for mourning, but also on the positive side in Scripture. In Luke chapter 7, we see a woman coming to Jesus and she washes his feet with her tears. There's, there's gratitude. And I know this sense really well. I can't tell you how often I have stood here on a Sunday morning worshiping God and felt just an overwhelming sense of gratitude for what God has done in my life, that it leads me to tears. I mean, are you guys grateful for what God has done? When you reflect upon who Jesus is and who I am and all that he has accomplished on our behalf and how well I am loved, I can't help but weep these tears of gratitude sometimes. Tears are a part of life. And tears are something that we can embrace as a part of life. It's one of the worst things in the world when you're genuinely discouraged or disappointed or lonely or sad and someone comes up and says, you know, turn that frown upside down. You just want to smack them and say, no, I'm not. I'm going to mourn. I'm going to grieve. And through scripture, we see you don't have to pretend like everything is okay all the time. The psalmists pour out their tears to God. They go to God with these tears. It's not a betrayal of God to tell him how lonely you are and frustrated you are and discouraged you are and anxious you are and disappointed you are. And all throughout scripture, we find that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us, that he will bring comfort to us. But if we have the wrong expectations, then you'll constantly spend your life, well, mourning and in tears. I think it's all about expectations. A few years ago, my my son Cohen, he was playing coach pitch, and I was his coach. And this was the last game of the year, and it was his last at bat in the last game of the year, and he struck out. Now, I had mixed emotions because that was like 10 Ks for me that day, which You're not supposed to strike out your own team, okay? But Cohen was like devastated about this. And he just could not stop thinking about it over and over. And what he didn't remember or what he didn't understand was that the fact that he hadn't struck out all year before that was not normal. That's not what you should expect in baseball. Baseball is failure, right? The best hitters fail seven out of 10 times. But if your expectations are right, then Cohen shouldn't be disappointed with a season with one strikeout. But so many of us have come and we've read things and heard things and listened to preachers who have our expectations wrong, who teach us that if we come to Christ and if we have the right type of faith and if we just pray hard enough and give enough money and do all the right things, then your life will be without these losses and this mourning and these tears. You'll be healthy and you'll be wealthy and you'll get what you want. Well, I can tell you that that's a recipe for bitter disappointment. First of all, you just look at the example of Jesus Christ. Was he wealthy? The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He was homeless. He was often hungry. He was often exhausted and tired. He was crucified because of what he taught. Jesus was an outcast. And what he tells to us is that if he was persecuted, imagine how much you'll be persecuted. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. That should be our expectation. He says to us that in this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart. Our expectation should be that this world will be a place of loss and disappointment, of discouragement, where we'll feel loneliness and we'll feel bitterness and we'll feel anxiety and concern. But Jesus says, take heart because I've overcome the world. He says that this kingdom, this world that you live in is not the only world. And we begin to catch this glimpse of this upside down world, this upside down kingdom in Matthew 5. And Jesus says that those who mourn are actually blessed. You're happy when you mourn. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible to be happy when you mourn? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. 
Because truthfully, as I've studied this passage, I've come to the realization that I didn't quite understand it for many years. And all of those things that we've talked about, loss, disappointment, discouragement, loneliness, anxiety and concern, all these things that cause us mourning and tears in this life, I don't think that Jesus is actually talking about any of those things in verse 4. I think in order to understand what he means by blessed, you have to follow a logical progression that Jesus gives to us from verse 3 to verse 4. And then it we'll see in subsequent weeks to verse 5 and beyond. And so I want you to follow me here and I want you to take notes, okay? So here's what Jesus says. He says, first, blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's try that again. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, Jesus is following this logical thought, remember. And he is saying that those who have a deep awareness of their spiritual need, you know your spiritual poverty. You understand how sinful you are, how bankrupt you are. You understand that, that there is nothing within you that can atone for your own sins. Jesus says you're blessed. And then he follows that up by saying, and blessed are those who mourn. Now, what type of mourning is he talking about here? I believe that he's talking about a mourning over our sin. Mourning over our sin. Jesus calls you blessed when you mourn over your sin. Now, why do we think that? The first, I've got a couple of reasons, but I think that it helps to look both at the Old Testament and the New and to see if we can sort of understand what Jesus is getting at. So if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, we're going to read the words here in verse 10 to see if we can understand this. Here's what it says. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. When you see grief, you can also think of mourning. For godly mourning produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly mourning produces death. There are two different types of response to an understanding of sin in this passage. The first one is a worldly understanding, and the second is a godly response. So a worldly response and a godly response. Let's talk about worldly grief first. Worldly grief, which it says leads to death now, worldly grief is, uh, it is someone who is grieving, not over their sin, not over the fact that they are separated from God, but they're grieving over the consequences of losing um, the esteem of the world. They're grieving over the consequences of what this sin has caused them. I, I think about a politician who is caught having an extramarital affair. And instead of grieving over the, the damage that he's done to his marriage and to his children, or even better, grieving over the, the way in which he has disobeyed God and hurt God's heart, they're concerned with their poll numbers. What does this do to my reelection chances? How does this hurt me with the base? That is a worldly type of grief. For a young person who gets caught looking at something on their cell phone or doing something with their cell phone they're not supposed to, instead of repenting over that sin, instead of repenting of how that sin hurts the heart of God, they repent over the fact that their parents took the phone away. They feel grief not over their sin, but over the consequence of it. That's a worldly grief, and the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, says that that produces death in you. But in contrast, there's another option, which is godly grief. And what we read here is that godly grief produces a repentance. Godly grief it produces repentance in our life. Now, repentance is this idea, not that I feel bad about my sin or that I feel sorry about my sin or that I know that I've made a mistake and that, you know, I'm going to try not to make that mistake again. Repentance is that I see the consequences of my sin and I'm turning my back on that sin and I'm walking in the opposite direction. I see and understand that I have been walking away from God, and now I am turning my back on that sinfulness, and I am walking toward Jesus. That's true repentance. All of us as believers, if we are going to come to Christ, have to understand repentance. Now, we know that it's not our repentance that saves us. The only way that our sin can be forgiven is that our sin had to be paid for. 
And the only way that our sin can be forgiven is by accepting the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf for us. But what Jesus says over and over in the New Testament is that we must repent, repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, turn to me, accept me, walk away from your sin. And what 2 Corinthians 7 tells us is that what that produces in us is salvation. So we have worldly grief and we have godly grief. Now remember, our words, the words that Jesus uses here are mourning and comfort. Blessed is the one who mourns for they'll receive comfort. So I want you to follow this logical progression. Jesus says you realize intellectually, you begin to understand that there is nothing salvation, nothing within you that can produce salvation. You begin to understand the deep poverty in your own spirit, which then moves from your intellectual to your emotional. And you begin to mourn over that sin. And that mourning produces in you a repentance, which leads to salvation. In Isaiah chapter 40, all the way back in the Old Testament, this prophet Isaiah is speaking to the people of Israel what God tells him to say. And for the first 39 chapters in Isaiah, this prophet spends his time telling the people of Israel that God's judgment is coming upon them. God will judge you. God will judge you. 39 chapters of it. And then verse 40, a transformation takes place as they begin, God begins to paint a future picture for Israel of what, that's, what life is like on the other side of this judgment. What life looks like after they repent and turn back to God. And here's what he tells Isaiah to say, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, cry out to her. Her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned. God says at the end of our iniquity, when our iniquity has been pardoned, what do we receive? Comfort. I can just imagine Jesus saying, blessed are those whose iniquities have been pardoned. I will give them comfort. Just like the people of Israel, these many years ago, God still offers that same comfort. In Psalm chapter 32, King David, a man who is acquainted with sin and repentance, here's what he says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Do you hear our words, church? We have mourning, we have comfort, and we have blessing. It is this logical progression for any who would want to experience the kingdom of heaven. It starts with an understanding that in myself, there is nothing that can save me. I am poor in spirit. And because of that, I realize that I am wretched and that I'm sinful and I can't do anything about it. And it causes me to mourn and to grieve over my sin. And in that moment of mourning and grief, I look to someone who can save me. I give up on my self-righteous justifications and I give up on my self-indulgent life seeking to be filled with all the things that this world has to offer. And I look to Jesus and it says that in my mourning, he will bring me comfort. And when I'm comfort, when, I, when, when my sins are forgiven and I'm comforted, I'm called blessed. Blessed is the one who mourns. I want to finish with this passage in Romans chapter 7. I've read this passage many, many times. As a teenager and as a high school and college student, I, I loved this passage because it just really spoke to me. This, this felt like God understood me when I read this passage. And now when we read this, I want you to be thinking in your mind two things. I want you to be thinking poor in spirit, which is an understanding of my spiritual need. And then I want you to be thinking mourning over my sin, which is an emotional reaction to it. And see if you can see this progression in Romans 7, 15 through 25. We got 10 verses here. So I want you to focus up. Here's what the apostle Paul says, for I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want to do, but instead I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin that is dwelling within me. 
Now here's poor in spirit. This is where I think it starts. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to actually carry it out. For I do not do the good things that I want, but the evil that I don't want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin that's dwelling within me. So I find it a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law which is waging war against the law of my mind, and it's making me a captive to the law of sin which dwells in my members. Can you see the hopelessness, the poverty of spirit, the recognition of sin? And now we see the mourning. Wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? And what's the answer, church? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then we see in Romans 8, verse 1, this wonderful verse that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Happy is the man who is no longer under the condemnation for his sin, who realizes and recognizes your sinfulness in in light of a holy and just and perfect God. When we genuinely repent, What we receive from God is not condemnation. Instead, when we genuinely repent, genuine repentance means that we are comforted. We receive the comfort of Jesus Christ. And what we see then is in this upside down kingdom, it's not those that are self-righteous. It's not those that live the easy life. It's not those that have no problems that are called blessed, but it's we Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. My friends, I want to invite you this morning to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every time I have studied this passage and thought about this passage, it has brought me to just a new recognition and a realization, both of my own sinfulness and my need for God, but also of just how blessed I am. That Jesus has exchanged my sin for his righteousness. He has taken my shame and he's lifted me up. He's given me a new hope and a new life and a new future. And not only that, he he has raised me up in the heavenly realms. He's given me a new inheritance. He says that heaven is mine. The kingdom of heaven is something that we can all experience, but none of us can get into the kingdom without first walking this path. And so this morning, if you are someone who is a follower of Christ, I want you to take this time to just genuinely spend a few quiet moments in thankfulness. Examine your own life for sin and remember the punishment that Jesus took upon himself, that sin is no small thing. It's something that we must repent of. If we want to be comforted from God, genuine mourning and repentance must take place first. But scripture says, though weeping may last for a night, joy comes in the morning. The same is true with us. When you repent, of your sin. Jesus is faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you don't have a relationship with God, if you've never come to a place where you have repented of your sin, I want you to know that you can talk to God right here, right now, in the quiet of this moment yourself. Let him know that you recognize that you have sinned and that you are sinful and that the wages of that sin is death. Acknowledge that you are missing that relationship with God and ask him to heal your heart, to forgive you for your sins and to cleanse you. When we come to the end of ourself is when we come to the beginning of God and when we come to God, we receive comfort and joy and blessing, knowing that our sins are forgiven 
that our chains are gone and that we get to be made brand new. So this morning, I'm just gonna ask Dylan to quietly play for about a minute. And I want you guys, wherever you're at in your relationship with God, talk to him today. If you don't have a relationship with God, start one. Jesus, forgive me. I want a relationship with you. That's the beginning. If you do have a relationship with God, I want you to spend time thanking him for what he has done.